Welcome to the Education of a Financial Planner, where we look at the major concepts in financial planning through the lens of two quant investors who are learning the ropes of the planning process and how to help clients achieve their long-term goals. Learn along with us as experienced financial planner Matt Ziegler helps us understand the most important financial planning concepts that impact all of us and how we can apply them to achieve the best outcomes in our financial lives. In each episode, we will work through one major financial planning concept from the ground up and learn how we can apply it in the real world. From retirement to college savings to taxes to estate planning, we will cover a wide range of topics that apply to each of our everyday lives. We hope you will join us in our learning journey. Justin Carboneau and Jack Forehand are principals at the Lydia Capital Management. Matt Ziegler is Managing Director at Sunpoint Investments. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect the opinions of Validia Capital or Sunpoint Investments. No information on this podcast should be construed as investment advice. Securities discussed in the podcast may be holdings of clients of Validia Capital or Sunpoint Investments. Today, we're going to talk about withdrawal rates, the 4% rule, and other rules of thumb that um, investors use in retirement when drawing down their portfolios. There's kind of a lot to unpack here. Um, and we're going to go down the rabbit hole of talking about asset allocation, why an investor's allocation may or may not change, and how all that plays into you know, a withdrawal rate type of strategy. Uh, but to start, we kind of want to start maybe at a higher level and explain the idea of what a safe withdrawal rate actually is and what it means. So Matt, um, I'll hand it over to you to sort of flush that out a little bit. Safe here really refers to this idea of, and let's flip it first. A safe withdrawal rate is no different than a safe uh, contribution rate. So the idea of what's a safe withdrawal rate, it's the amount that's safe to draw out of something. And in most cases, that means sustainable. So why do I say compare it to a contribution rate? So when we're saving money, we're going to use our three C's, calendar, cash flow, crap, or balance sheet. And we're going to say we have over some period of time, a surplus in our cash flow, and that's contributing to us acquiring some asset on our balance sheet. So the contribution rate that's safe allows us to acquire the asset. The flip side of that is usually when we retire, now we're not accumulating anymore, we're decumulating, we're spending something down. So how do we fill a deficit in our cash flow with some something on our balance sheet, usually some asset? So a safe withdrawal rate is the safe amount of money to take from some asset to plug some deficit in our cash flow. All the research around this is how do you do that sustainably for your retirement or multi-generations or whatever you're doing. I think the research um, that originated in the mid 1990s sort of points to over a 30 year period on a balanced portfolio, an investor should be able to withdraw something like 4% off of their portfolio without running out of money. Um, So that's uh, at a high level what the 4% rule is, but um, where did it come from, Matt? And and, and am am I describing or explaining that correctly? You're explaining it well, and just in in prepping for this conversation, I was like, you know, there are there are at least three things from 1994 that I think about on a near daily basis, and that's that's probably Pulp Fiction, the movie, Illmatic by Nas, and William Bengen's 1994 study about determining uh, withdrawal rates using historical data. So no joke, this is a 94 study that's still relevant in 2023. And, and here's why. He's figuring out what that safe withdrawal rate to draw down in assets, in this case, a portfolio of stocks and bonds, over various 30-year windows. And he's looking at like 1926, I believe, up until uh, when he wrote the paper in 1994, and says, if you're withdrawing approximately 4% from this portfolio, In most scenarios, you can go over a 30-year period and not run out of money. And that 4% strategy, not a rule, because there's no, like, this isn't gravity here, but that 4% withdrawal strategy over the period that he tested said, most of the time, you're not going to run out of money if you do only 4%. Thinking back to your uh, your three things you uh, left from 1994, it seems like two of them are a lot more entertaining than the third one. Uh, one seems a little bit out of place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I literally think of these things all the time because I'm just as likely to be talking to somebody now today about their their with distribution strategy and what makes it safe or smart or whatever else as I am to drop a random, you know, um, Jackrabbit Slims or bring out the gimp joke. 
it seems like in coming up with a 4% rule, there have to be a lot of assumptions. Like, you know, what asset allocation are you invested in? Like how, how, what percentage of time am I willing to live with failure? You know, what kind of confidence in, interval do I want? You know, think, things like inflation. I mean, can you just talk about kind of the, insum- the assumptions he used in the paper? Yeah, and understand too, like he wrote this paper and I, I use Pulp Fiction and Illmatic as, as a great stepping stone because stuff got built off of this. Uh, a few years later, you have the Trinity study. Then you have like Kitsis and Wade Fow and all these people who build off it into the modern era because anybody who's giving financial planning advice specifically to people is figuring out with this puzzle of how do you safely draw down assets when you shift and markets aren't wholly predictable. So bad stuff happens. How do you live through those periods? So some really, really smart stuff that's just... It's crazy that this didn't happen until 94 in such an articulate paper, and I'm sure versions of it did, but it's also pretty astonishing how good of a paper this is. So he's looking at inflation rates. So when you start the withdrawal, he's actually taking like CPI and netting it against. So if you start off at $5,000 a year or a month or whatever it is, you're indexing that for inflation. And he's also looking at various periods of where like Sometimes stocks do awesome, sometimes stocks do terrible, sometimes bonds do awesome, sometimes bonds do terrible. And in that 1920s period up to the 1990s, you get a bunch of scenarios with a bunch of different inflation environments. And he's basically saying that 30 out of 31 times in that period, so 96% or whatever confidence interval, the 4% rule doesn't break down. And then he also shows us if you increase the stock allocation, what does that look like? If you lower the distribution rate from four to three, you succeed all the time. If you raise it up to six, your confidence interval of what works drops. And we get all this out of this one study looking at the mix of assets, the inflation rate applied to the distribution, and the time period we look at for success. So for the 96% confidence, it was a 50-50 stock and bond allocation, is that right? So he uses 50-50 as like the baseline allocation in the paper, but if memory serves, I think he also takes it up to like 75% and say, you can get a high in- higher confidence interval or a longer period of time if you raise the equity allocation. And I believe he says like 75% is kind of optimal, but that might not sit right in everybody's gut for what you gotta live through to get there. It is one of those things where people just take like one like hard and fast rule out of it, but he was actually looking at like a lot of things in the paper. You know, people just say 4% rule, but there's actually a lot more to it than that. And that's why I would stress, and you'd probably get all sorts of comments on Twitter and other places. It's, it's really not a rule, and he didn't write it as intended to be some like rule handed down from God on stone tablets. He wrote it as, let's look at the historical data and see like where do we even start? What's a baseline for thinking about this? Because we got to help people with these decisions. How does taxes play into this? I was just thinking about this. Like you could have withdrawals from a traditional IRA where you have to pay tax. You could have withdrawals from a Roth where you don't have to pay tax. And it seems like that would kind of impact this whole thing. Did he look at that at all in the paper? Do you know? So in the paper, he's not directly talking about this. That does show up in some of the follow-up work, not the Trinity study, which is late nineties, but like Kitsis and Fowl both have addressed this in different places. Um, PFAU, if anybody's Googling it, we can put a link link in the notes for this. But the initial point that I made about calendar cash flow balance sheet, and when we're decumulating, we're solving a cash flow deficit problem with something off of the balance sheet. So your tax piece gets solved there. And that asset allocation versus asset location mix of how you're paying for that deficit. Yeah, if you take money out of an IRA, you're probably paying taxes. And that changes the way we solve for the cash flow deficit in the current period. Likewise, if you're pulling money out of a Roth, maybe you need to pull less out because we're solving the deficit problem without increasing the tax bill. And that's just another reason why most people need a professional to work through this stuff. Investors tend to love these general rules, like the 4% rule, or I guess I'm supposed to call it the 4% strategy. Um, but like, what do you think about those from, from your seat as a planner? Like, are, are, what is good about these general rules and what's bad about them? What's good about them is they're like baseline assumptions. And I like to think about these things like, what's the stuff that you should know before you go out there? If you're gonna go on a long hike, like do you have a backpack with enough water and some food to like get through the day of burning all these calories? If, if you're gonna like take your kids to the beach, did you just wing it and walk out the door and you didn't bring any toys or whatever else? Like you gotta do something 
to plan, and to plan you need some baseline expectation. And these rules of thumb are really good at giving us these baseline expectations. And I will say, so a couple of things on this. Baseline expectations that I love, and I, I threw these out here, I still think, you know, the Ashvin Chabra aspirational stuff, this is the, like, just use simple math for a lot of stuff. You don't have to worry about market returns or inflation or whatever else. You'll get pretty close to your numbers on baseline assumptions. And then uh, Michael Pompian, one of my business partners in this book, he goes through a bunch of different behavioral types that we can use to think about for like solving for how different people respond differently to this stuff. And then again, Wade Fowl and uh, Alex, I wanna say uh, Mer Merja or Mergia, I can never say his name right. Um, they have this RISA model, which is retirement income style awareness. And I think like that's a really great thing too, because it kind of tells you what rules of thumb to use. And they have a cool way of thinking about how do you feel about probability models versus safety first, and then how do you feel about optionality versus commitment? And that gives you four quadrants, and there's actually different rules of thumb to use in helping people depending on where they're starting from in each of those four quadrants. So rules of thumb matter, but like know which ones matter to you and why. So let me ask you this. Um, I'll kick this one to Jack. Jack, I'm a, I'm a retiree. I have a uh, you know, million dollar portfolio. I'm taking 4% off of it. Um, so I'm taking 40 grand a year. Why don't I just invest that 100% in the stock market? We know the market over the long run, I can expect you know, maybe a nine to 11% return. You know, that's gonna, on paper, that meets the, with, that's more than almost double, that's double the with, withdrawal rate. So, you know, why don't I just do that? Yeah, you know, that was a big lesson for me earlier in my career is you would think, well, wait, if I'm getting 10% in the stock market, I could probably withdraw something close to 10%. And the reason you can't is it comes down to sequence risk. So that 10% is very risky. And if you get the bad returns first and you, you draw a, a big amount of money out, you, you basically have ruined yourself in, in terms of the future. And, you know, this is something that like I've thought about a lot. Like, it, it, so let's say I had a, a portfolio that could return 5% over time. And let's take inflation out of the, out of the equation for now. You know, if, if I know for sure that portfolio is going to return 5%, what is my safe withdrawal rate? Well, my safe withdrawal rate is something like 5% because I know I'm going to get the money and I can withdraw the money as it comes in. Well, what if my portfolio returns 10% and it's the stock market? You would think I should get a much higher, you know, I should get a much higher withdrawal rate. But the, the truth is I actually get a lower withdrawal rate. You know, we talked about the 4% rule because of that sequence risk, I actually can take less. And so there's this balance here between sort of the risk you're taking and the safe withdrawal rate and the sequence risk is sort of the thing that brings them together. You're, you're absolutely right on that. And I think it's also really important too, and I'm gonna see, I'll grab, I'll grab a chart and we can either show it in this or we can put it in the notes from the RISA stuff is the way you're allocated is gonna determine this. And then the way you respond to those allocations are gonna determine this too. Because if you're cut from the cloth that you can accept more variability so you're gonna say, hey, the odds are in my favor. I can take more stock returns. But like, you still need the discipline to take from the right stuff at the right time. And I kind of think of this as like, they're zigging and zagging. Like I own stuff in my portfolio that one's gonna zig and another's gonna zag. But then like, don't just stop at zig and zag if you think that way from an odds basis and you're trying to somewhat optimize around the math and that's the way your brain works, then like, great. Like you should also like, Cover some other bases, get some zegs and some zogs and some zugs in there too, where you might own different types of asset classes, or you might have ways to think about it that allows you to stick to that program. Other people can't do that, and they favor like the commitment over the optionality in, in the RISA framework, and that's really important too. And those people might say, I'm gonna take a much more stable return stream. I'm gonna buy an insurance product or something like that. And that stable return stream gives me way less in terms of like uh, the optionality of what I can do, but I might be able to be happier in my life just because I know that that mailbox money is hitting every single month. And, yeah. I, and I think that the overall investor mindset changes significantly when someone goes from making money accumulating to retiring and now all they have is their retirement portfolio and if they're taking social security i mean that's what they got they're you know some people end up getting side jobs and working but it changes the um view and their tolerance to be able to deal with 
you know, more risk in the underlying portfolio, at least from what I've seen in working with investors that have migrated from like working to uh, retirement. Absolutely. It's a, it's a giant shift and it's a multi-year shift. And just for most people, and this is on the pure psychological side, forget the safe withdrawal rates for a second. It's literally talking to people, you're retiring in a year or three years or a month or whatever it is. Get a calendar out, back to the three C's again. Get a calendar out. Let's talk about what you're gonna do when you wake up on Monday morning and you're not going to work. Just starting to block out all the shifts that happen psychologically as you move from all these realities, including just earning money and what happens to your cash flow versus spending money and how that impacts your cash flow. You gotta think through that psychologically. It's huge. Yeah, the other thing I think is important to keep in mind with safe withdrawal rates is what we're really trying to do is we're trying to cut off the tail. So going back to my example of 10% and 5%, you know, in most cases, if I was to withdraw 5% off a portfolio that's returning 10%, or I was to withdraw 5% off a portfolio that's returning 5%, I'm gonna have more money in the long run with the 10% option. The problem is I can't live with the 20% or something on the other side chance that I'm gonna have zero money because then I have zero money. And so by cutting, you're gonna to have to give up some return to be able to cut off that tail but you know, that tail can destroy you know, your financial future, so you've got to cut it off. We always say to people, part, part of like the generic value proposition when we're talking about stuff is it's designing financial plans and investment strategies that A, you can understand, and B, will evolve with your life and the world around you. And that means you're gonna have these like shocks. You could have the bigger stock allocation because you can stomach the volatility, but like, what do you do when the market pukes? Uh, likewise, you have a bigger stock allocation, but what if the market pukes and you lose your job or your pension stops coming in or something else? And so knowing how you're wired to handle those things, that's, that's the key. And working with a professional who can work with you to understand you to properly reflect that in the way you're approaching this thing to exactly what you said, like just cut off the tails Make sure like I can live to fight another day, but I want to live to fight another day without being horribly traumatized from the, the battle I just fought in. When you think about setting up a safe withdrawal rate for clients, how do you think about the returns assumptions for stocks and bonds? I mean, do you just look at kind of the long-term returns of stocks and bonds and assume that, or is it, is it more complicated than that? So I think everybody in every firm you work with has some version of their capital market assumptions and then they how, how they do portfolio optimization or think about portfolios in combination with other, with other things you're doing. And I think it's actually it's a question that rarely gets asked, but usually something we touch on, I bet you guys do too. Like you have to have some type of market, capital market assumptions for your firm and for this process because that helps inform that baseline of like, are we looking at the history of stocks as an asset class back to the beginning of time? Are we putting valuation or sentiment or some other tool over it to say, this is what historical is, but this is what we think over the period that we're looking at? And you have to be thoughtful about that and you need that in your approach. Critically, if you're gonna do that, there's two things I wanna say. Critically, if you're gonna do that, you gotta be transparent about what you're doing. If you're gonna just assume historical assumptions, like make sure you know what you're gonna do if historical doesn't happen. And then the other part is don't forget about the other things that can sneak up and surprise you, like inflation or other shocks that might upset you. And, and what's your plan for that? So have your assumptions, but then also have the things that challenge those assumptions so you have a plan to respond in advance, not after your assumptions got checked in real time. We'll put this in the actual podcast, um, but Vanguard publishes um, and a lot of firms publish their outlook for different asset classes. And so the 60-40 portfolio coming into 2021 had a forecasted return because stocks were expensive and bond yields were very, very low of 3.83%. That was the expected 10-year median return that they were projecting for the 60-40. For the at the end of 2022, after the stock market declined and obviously the yields have come way up, the expected return is just over 6%. So that's a significant increase in the expected long-term return of the 6040. And the other thing that I like that Vanguard does is they have like these bands. So they give you the median, but then they give you, you know, on the higher and lower end, um, what you might expect out of that type of balanced portfolio. So uh, anyways, I, I just think it's improved a lot. And I think, you know, for investors that are looking at this 
Vanguard is a good source to turn to uh, to get these numbers. And, and I think the other thing to keep in mind with these expected returns these places put out is they're usually like seven to 10 year returns. So if over seven, if, we're, if we have very high valuations and you expect you know mean reversion over seven to 10 years, that can be pretty harsh. But a lot of people have like 30 years in their t- retirement time frame. So the mean reversion, you know, the actual return you're gonna get is a lot closer to the long-term return over 30 years than it is over seven to 10 years. So I don't know how you think about that in your practice, Matt, but I think that's an important point to keep in mind. This comes back to this idea of like, if you care about investment returns and you're in that optionality orientation mixed with like the probability based orientation, which is why you're like, you have investments that you're going to draw on and you're, you're expecting to realize some of the just realities of returns being lumpy and sort of chaotic, then you should ask about the approach towards the capital market assumptions that's being input into your plan or from your allocator, if you're hiring one. Uh, within that, the way we think about it is we have our like longer term assumptions and then we have our shorter term assumptions based on context and we both adjust plans and portfolios around that. So going into last year, if we just use the Vanguard framework that you laid out, like going into last year, the expected returns are really low. So probably take less risk when those forward expected returns are low. And then conversely, like where we are right now, you can probably dial some of that risk up and that doesn't mean throw it all in stocks, but it just means reconsider the allocation in your portfolio live and in real time to say current market environment just made it easy to get almost like 5% on cash as of today. So how's that build into your portfolio and what you need to be in your safe withdrawal rate? How do you think about adjusting these based on actual outcomes? So for instance, if, if I get lucky and I'm, you know, I get really great returns in my first 10 years of retirement, you know, now I've got more money than I thought, but I've also got a shorter time frame for the rest of my life. So it seems like that would support a much higher withdrawal rate. But how do you think about like going to clients and adjusting that based on the actual outcome you get in the real world? So going back to like the goals based planning episode, it's really, really important to visit this concept of your prioritization can shift after a really good or bad outcome. And you have to have extra emphasis on like the Ashvin Chabra work again, like you have to have a prioritization of your goals and what's essential to you, what's important to you or what's aspirational to you. So Jack, if you, uh, if market returns go bananas to the upside, that's when you're buying what the private Island in the boat. Am I remembering that correctly? Oh yeah. Yeah. That would take a serious return, but uh, yeah, that, that would be the goal. <laughs> okay. So we get the serious return. Like we want to buy the Island in the boat and knowing that's safe. And likewise, if returns totally suck, we have to make sure that like you can pay for the house or pay for, you know, food and groceries or whatever else. So, The other part of that, and this is where it's like advisors, we know the types of clients we work with and clients need to know the types of advisors they work with and where the skills are, like that's real. It goes back to that value prop of a plan that you can understand and evolves with your situation and the world around you. So if stuff gets good, what are we gonna do with the good outcome? If stuff gets bad, how are we gonna respond to the bad outcome? And in the bad outcome, what things are reasonable to cut versus what things are like non-negotiable? And then with the non-negotiables, does that get me to my safe withdrawal strategy where I'm not, you know, belly up? And for the people who are the proponents of what we call the safety first approach and maybe are more high on the uh, commitment scale than the optionality scale, like for those people, it's like having a giant war chest of cash might be the answer to mitigate the market returns and always having three or five years in advance in cash to say like, as long as I don't have to sell my stocks when they're down, as long as I don't have to sell my privates when we're down, everything else will take care of itself. And that's what it boils down to. Just know know who you are first and how you're gonna deal with a really good and a really bad outcome. You know, we've talked about people that are able to only withdraw 4% of their portfolio or maybe less because they've saved, but then there, there are certainly a swath of Americans out there that, you know, are unfortunately unprepared for retirement and they may go into retirement um having to draw down you know more than four percent and in some cases hopefully not much more but and that can be dicey because you know if someone has a nest egg it's money that's there but you know maybe they're drawing six or seven percent of the portfolio down and so you know maybe in a future episode i mean there, there are certainly things you could do um you could you know try to take less withdraws when possible. I mean, maybe you try to go out and get a part-time job. Um, you know, maybe you try to do this optionality thing where you're taking advantage of different market environments, but 
you know, there, that, that can happen too. And, and I just think that, you know, you want to, as, as investors and savers and retirees, we want to try to avoid as much as possible getting that type of situation. It's totally worth saying. And again, the, the three C's on many people's calendar, there are periods where there's higher expected withdrawal rates from, from their balance sheet, from their assets, because there's like a deficit. So the person who retires at 60 and from 60 to 65 pre-Medicare is a bigger healthcare expense, and maybe they're spending a larger amount of uh, post-tax assets down in that period to meet. So like the withdrawal strategy for like the first five years of retirement might be like 7%. And we have to figure out how to build the portfolio to absorb that. But then maybe at 65 or 66, Social Security and some retirement account or deferred comp or something else kicks in. And then that changes the composition. And for most people, it's not just this super simple static number. Working through that and blocking that out over the calendar with people, how does my cash flow and the amount that I'm taking over time shift? That's a big part of what we do every day for clients. And that's a, that's a big part of just like the peace of mind back to what Jack said about just eliminating the tails. If you can mostly eliminate the tails or understand around your base case, what's going to happen and how it dials up and down, you can feel a lot more control of your financial life, even in the retirement strategy or retirement phase when you're figuring out what's safe for me to do in the period in front of me. I think it's also important to keep in mind, there's not like some hard and fast rule that like you're, if, if you're withdrawing 4.5% of your portfolio, you're a complete failure and it can never be fixed. Like people tend to get on this thing. Like if I don't have a million dollars in retirement, it's a disaster. Like, like you were alluding to there, there's ways to deal with these things. I mean, obviously if you're withdrawing hundred percent of your portfolio, that's a major problem. Um, that, mm -hmm. that's going to be very difficult to fix, but around the edges, like you're not, a, it's not a catastrophe. If you're like withdrawing 5% at the beginning, you know, it, things can be done to help with that. And that's, that's why it's a strategy, not a rule. That's why you want to understand your baselines and how you're minimizing your tails. And even uh, Bengen came back and like revised. He added small cap stocks and something else. So it's like 4% is the safe withdrawal, straight, withdrawal rate for just large caps and like investment grade bonds. It's part of the Trinity survey too. But then it was like, okay, well, if it's not just large caps and you add small caps, you could probably get to 4.5 and be okay. And there's some work around like alternative investments or alternative strategies that help increase those numbers too. So it's, there's a million ways to solve for this and they should be based around what you're comfortable with accepting on your, on your baseline assumptions that a professional can come in and say, this is why we think this is safe or reasonable. And if it's the plan you can stick to, then the rest takes care of itself. What we're really trying to do is also worth saying and this is part of why Bengen, again, I think did something really well, is we're just trying to look at our assets over time with some amount of inflation. How do we like just not have a less than inflated version of the expenses we need to spend? And this is how we do it with portfolios of things that help keep us fighting off the inflation monster. So I think the summary is we've talked about what a safe withdrawal rate is. Um, we start with the 4% rule, which was developed in the mid nineties, but that is a rule of thumb and a baseline that we can work off of because everyone's going to have different assumptions and spending habits that they have. We talked about the importance of sequence risk and returns and understanding that, you know, what you're really trying to do is, well, it, it, you know, you're giving up by taking less risk you're maybe giving up some returns, uh, but you're removing that tail event that you actually, uh, you know, see your portfolio or part of your portfolio maybe go down by 50% and then be potentially running out of money um, sooner than you want to. Uh, we talked about expected returns and the importance of those, but as Matt brought up, I think, you know, planning both for or thinking about what the surprises can be both on the downside and upside of those expected returns in the future. And then, um, you know, priorities can shift based on your goals and based on different outcomes with, with your portfolio. And b maybe to sum up, remember the 4% rule is really a strategy and not a hard and fast rule. Hi guys, this is Justin again. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. You can follow Jack on Twitter at, at practicalquant. You can follow me on Twitter at, at JJ Carbono and follow Matt on Twitter at, at Cultish Creative. If you found this discussion interesting and valuable, please subscribe in either iTunes or on YouTube, 
or leave a review or a comment. Also, if you have any ideas for topics you'd like us to cover in the future, please email us at excessreturnspod at gmail.com. We would like this to be a listener-driven podcast and would appreciate any suggestions. Thank you.